Speed is actually moving forward. This is now one of the warehouses of Amazon. So there are robots, and the robots are reorganizing the whole warehouse. So that the items that we need are close to the operators. And for Christmas, we will have all the Christmas items very close and so on. So, that works well, but that's not the robots that we, we, we're dreaming of. Uh, that's the kind of robot we want. Right? Robots in whole life, in the streets, in the real world, where everything is dynamic, when everything is moving. Robots that are doing many different things. So, the main question is, can we use the same technology as what we use for the manufacturing industries to do this kind of robots? Is it a good stepping stone to go forward? And of course, everybody is trying to do this for a long time. So this is the HRT4, uh, this is a very nice robot, very complicated thing, also very expensive. Uh, and it works very well. Uh, but you can see it really works like a robot, and not like a human. And the reason why it works like this is the way it's programmed. It's not because the mechanics are not very good. It's because we don't know how to program a robot to work exactly like a human. Also, you should note that the room is empty. So the room is empty, floor is perfectly flat, uh, no object, no things, and that tells something about what we can achieve with this kind of robot. So the reason why the way it's programmed is that basically this kind of robot acts like a chess player. So if we know, if we know everything, then we can plan the best move and we will deal with this. But what happens if uh, something is wrong? So something is not perfectly as expected. So this, uh, this is video from uh, the DARPA challenge, and the challenge was to put some robots in real life scenario, which is not that real because uh, it's quite simple, but still simplified. But still, the idea is that if you want to send robots like uh, to Fukushima, for instance, they will have to maybe walk, open the door, uh, drill something in the wall, uh, turn the valve, or things like this. And this is what we obtain. And these are not basic robots. We have like the most expensive and the most advanced robots in the world so far. And each of them is maybe one million dollars. Just to give you an idea of how much effort and they are programmed by the best programmers. <laughs> so this is uh, for complicated robots, but even for simpler robots, we try to send a few robots in some risky operations. <laughs> so for instance, 2005, we send this robot to like Conchita in a mudslide, and this one in the mine. These two ones uh, were sent to Fukushima, and the pattern is that they never come back. Uh, <laughs> this one has been, uh, I don't know, something happened after two minutes. Uh, this one after 700 meters was taken away. Uh, in Fukushima, we have these robots and they are lost. We don't really know what happens. This one did nine meters in the reactor and then we lost it. So we still don't know how to make robots that can really deal with the real world. So, we look at all these robots, so they are in a very protected environment, which nothing can happen. In a factory, you have cages around the robots. Uh, in these robots, we make the environment for the robots. So we have QR codes, we have special shelves. So that's special environment, that's nothing like the real world. But the real world is more like this. Uh, everything is moving, everything is dynamic, it's very hard to predict. Most anything can happen at you. Time. So how can we really make robots that can deal with this real world and not just a fictive world which is like a factory? So just to summarize this, um, so factory robots we are doing the same thing again and again and in real world robots we want robots to do many different things. The environment is known in a factory because we build the environment for the robots uh, but in real life the world is dynamic and they, they are to play. Factory robots, everything will work as expected, but in real life, well, we don't know everything. Uh, we are not just passionate on. And if something is broken in a factory robot, well, we call the engineer, we call the support staff, but in real life, usually the robot has to deal with it itself and find a solution. <coughs> so, we have a huge difference uh, between factory robots and robots for the real world. And the question is is it the first step for this, or do we need to start over and start again with a different approach? for real life robots. So it could seem that this is a good first step. I mean, simpler, but we cannot deal with this complicated world to start with a simpler set, uh, with simpler environment. But I don't think it's true, 
And if we look at animals, so they are very smart, they deal with the real world, and they don't play chess. They are not trying to predict everything, they are not acting as a chess player in a very rational way, but they still survive in the very, very complicated world. And books famously uh, wrote the paper about this in the 90s. Uh, elephants don't play chess, and that really captured this idea that elephants are smart animals, and still they don't play chess. So why do we build robots that can play chess instead of building robots that will be like elephants? And actually, you can have very simple examples of robots that are very simple and can deal with the real world. So these robots, uh, you can buy them, uh, they have to but you can also make them. So it's basically uh, the head of a toothbrush, and which you put a vibrator from a cell phone. And that's it. And they can deal with the real world. There is no electronics, no sensor, nothing. And because of the way they vibrate, they deal with this world, and they don't need to plan, they don't need to understand it, and they actually are very, very robust. You can just throw them away, and they'll still work, and you can do whatever you want. So, but seems that there is different way to see robots than factory. This is another example near Roomba. So Roomba, no, everybody knows it now. Uh, but it does not plan, it does not perceive the room. We have no map of the room, except new versions, it seems so. But it shows that we can do many things in the world without using the way we are doing robots. Like, I know everything about the environment, I can plan what I do, I do the way I want. So, let's go back to these complicated robots and <laughs> ask what we can do to help them, to make them more like animals. Because Roomba is a simple robot. If you want to robot that can duplicate stuff, how can we help them by seeing them more like animals? And I think the main issue with these robots is not that they fail, because we always fail many times in the day, uh, is that they don't get back to their feet and try again. And try again until they find a solution. So I would like this robot to say, okay, I did a mistake, I will try again, and maybe my arm is broken, but I need to finish my mission, so we continue. So that's the thing I try to do uh, with a real example. So this is a robot that we have in the lab. Uh, it's a very simple robot, actually it's made with the same actuators as the modular robots that we have there. Uh, so there is nothing very interesting in the mechanics of this robot. We have small PC, we have few actuators. What's interesting is how we program it to be able to react to unforeseen situations. <coughs> so it can work like this. Uh, so we program this and then we break it. So in that case, we unplug one wire. And of course, that does not work anymore. So the robot doesn't know what's broken. Something is wrong, it's not working as expected. So the question now is, what can we do now? How can we solve this issue? So, traditional approach to this, the way we all think we should do it, uh, is to think like a medical doctor, say, or like an engineer. Say, I will open the box, I will diagnose the problem, and I will then fix it. And this is how medical doctors do it, this is how engineers do it. If my TV is broken, I will open it, uh, try to understand what's wrong, and fix it. But actually doing diagnosis with robots is very, very difficult. Uh, you can see that engineers and medical doctors, they need skills and a lot of training, and they need equipment. They need some equipment to diagnose what's wrong with the robot or what's wrong with you. Also, if you want to put this in the robot, you need to have sensors everywhere, and sensors are very expensive, so we don't want to do this. And if you do an error in your diagnosis, then you will react in the wrong way, which is probably not what you want. So diagnosis is a very intuitive and rational approach, uh, but actually it's much harder than what it seems. So can we do it differently? If we go back to the factory robot, can we just forget our intuitions about how we should do it and look at animals? So this dog uh, has only two legs and it can still walk and it seems actually it seems happy. So <clears throat> If you look at animals, animals are not medical doctors, and they can react to many different injuries and many different difficult situations. And they do it by two ideas. First, they learn, and they learn by trial and error. If my ankle is broken, for instance, I will quickly find a way uh, to limp so I can go back home, and I don't need to understand what is exactly wrong with my ankle. I can continue to walk and find a way in a few trials and do something. So I would like my robots to do the same thing try to use some try and error approach so that we can find a way to cope with the damage. We <laughs> so, 
So we want to use learning. Uh, so what, what we usually do in learning right now in robotics, uh, mostly what works well is imitation learning. So we start with demonstration like this, and then the robot can uh, generalize and manage to find a way to, in that case, play the the issue here is that these algorithms are not creative enough. If anything can happen to you, but you have nobody to explain you should put your arm in this way, and you have to be autonomous, and you have to be creative. So what we can do for this is to look at other <coughs> try and error processes in nature. And the best one, in my opinion, is evolution. So you had two small lectures about evolution, so I will not explain why it's wonderful. But we know that in nature, it's a very, very creative process. And we also know that we can simulate it on a computer and achieve very creative things. So for instance, this antenna has been sent to space. It has been designed by an evolutionary algorithm. So a process for which we have a population solution on a computer, we select the best ones, uh, we mutate them, and we look at kind of them. This robot was evolved as well. Uh, because we have seen some shapes, some other robots. So it seems that evolution is a very creative process. So we'd like to put this into robots so that they're creative and something won't happen. The issue is evolution is very slow. So it's very creative and very slow, billions of years on the Earth. And the opposite side, we have classic learning algorithms for robots that are much faster but not creative. So what we want is something there, uh, something which is very creative, uh, very creative and very fast. And I could say that's basically what we observe in animals. In a few trials, we find crazy things very creative. So, how can we do this? Uh, the basic idea is okay, animals do some trial and error, they are creative, but they are also guided by a lot of things that come from prior knowledge. So, the first one is evolution, because they have been evolved, they have good instincts, and then start with things that are likely to work because they have been selected for this. Also, there are some, uh, usually many animals have some kind of childhood, so they try their body, they try what they can do, they try to jump, they try to walk, they play. So this is experience that could be used in the future if something will happen. Also, from imitation, you can look at the users, like the parents, uh, from their experience. So, the key idea is that we want to learn, but we want to generate some similar instincts. So we can guide the search and guide learning to try things that are likely to work in the world. So I will not enter into technical details because then it becomes a bit complicated, but we have two steps. First one is an emotional algorithm in simulation in which the robot is intact, and the robot tries to find many good ways to achieve the mission. So in that case, that will be working, so the robot will try to find many ways to work. And the best way to move with six legs, the best way to move with five legs, the best way to move is the body to the forward, to the backward, with the weight on the right leg. And so, on. so just try to find good ways to do the thing, and all of them have to be different. So at the end of this, we have this kind of map. Uh, so we start with uh, everything that the robot can do, and then at the end, we have a map of what's interesting, and what's good, and what we expect. And if something wrong happens to the robot, then we switch to this. Uh, then we use some learning that's guided by this. So we know that, for instance, the behavior that corresponds to this red part here uh, is something that's likely to work. So we try. We try it, and we increase the confidence in your prediction, and we say, actually, it does not work, probably because the robot is broken. So let's not try this again. Let's try something very different that is likely to work. And guided by these instincts, then we can quickly find something that works on the robot. And the reason why it works uh, is that because even if we only explore the intact robot, there are some behaviors that will work the same even if the robot is broken. So if you find a way to work with only five legs, if your leg is broken but it does not matter, it will not change anything. So that's the kind of behaviors we're looking for. So we're not preparing for the damage, but we're preparing for well, what can I do with my body. So, just to illustrate what we have, so at the first step in simulation, we find 13 different ways to work. And so behind each of these pixels here, that's a different way to work. And that's not all of them. We have 13,000 here, but uh, in theory, we could have billions of them. So that's only the best ones. That's a good collection of the most promising ones. When we put this into the robot, and you have the map here, and the robot says, I'll try something. So we try the first thing, that does not work. 
So we update our knowledge. So we update our expectations <coughs> about what could work and this work. And so we have updated this. We try something else, something that's different. And given our instincts, say that most probably this could work. So we need a few trials, but the third one. Uh, the fourth one, so we start to have something that works a bit better. You see that the trajectory is here, so what is moving forward, not on the straight line, but a bit better. And this one is actually very nice. You see that the trajectory is good, and the robot is working very differently, but still is able to compensate for the damage. So we try the last thing, it doesn't work as well. So after 40 seconds, the so robot found a way to cope with the damage. And this is what we can do now. So it's a very different way to work, but it can continue its mission. And in spite of this leg, like, and apparently the robot never understood that the leg is broken. What it understood is that the performance was bad, and now it recovered uh, most of the stuff. So you can say that the gate is quite surprising. Uh, I'm not able to program a gate like this, like jumping and so on. But it's very dynamic. So it's the kind of thing we want to see, and we see more in animals that are using the dynamic of their body than in what we usually program uh, in factories. So we tried this on uh, other damage. So in this one, we cut one leg in half. And as you can see, it doesn't work anymore. And after 25 seconds, we can work again. And again, we can <laughs> observe the creativity of this process. We work in a very different way. We also try this on the robots. Uh, so we have an arm like this, and the goal is simply to put uh, the ball in the bin. And in that case, we work one joint here. Yeah. So the joint is not moving anymore, and of course, it's bad phase. And so, but we have to try and find a way to cope with damage. So we use the exact same algorithm. So that's why it's not only an algorithm for working robots, it's a general algorithm that we can use for any robot that can that, that will be damaged or that need to be able to deal with unexpected events. So we see all the trials here and we see the same kind of map, so we update uh, what we think is the most probable. And after uh, 20 seconds, then we found a way to cope with damage and you see that the shape of the robot is weird. And that's because one joint is broken, so we had to find a way to do it. So we tried uh, many other damages. Uh, we tried with uh, five different damage conditions on the example robot. So we cut the leg, we cut one, we cut one, we, we move two legs. We also added a piece of wood at the end of the leg saying, oh, I'm on the field and the robot is broken, so I need to do something right now. And it's not perfect, but still, uh, the robot needs to be able to do with this. So we have seen this. So, <coughs> Of course, people don't do this exactly. They don't implement this algorithm. They are not embedding an evolutionary algorithm. But there are a few parallels with what we are doing and what animals do. So first, they are not medical doctors. So they are not performing diagnosis if something is wrong. They are not saying, uh, smoking is wrong in my ankle. How can I test it? How can I measure something? And so on. They just try and see something that works in spite of the damage. Uh, they are using trials and they are guided by their intuitions that come from experience, from evolution, from many other things. So we never learn from scratch, and that's the kind of thing we want in the world. Then, the way we use and the way we try things is called by optimization. It's actually very similar to the way humans do it. So if humans want to optimize a function, solve this problem, they actually do almost exactly the same thing as what we are doing. And then the last thing is that while going as a phase, but in which the robot is not moving and just playing in its head, and exploring things uh, without moving, and then phases in which it can try things in the world. And that's actually uh, related to what we could do in our dreams. So in our dreams, we could explore, do many things, be creative, and in the morning, we say, ah, this is a nice idea, let's try it. Sometimes that's a good idea, sometimes that does not work, but we have to try to know. So it's a bit what we're doing here, so what is dreaming and all these different ways to achieve the task. And in the morning, we try things that are the most promising, and then we have data knowledge. I think that robots in factories and robots for the real world are fundamentally different. We should not see them as the same machines. We have to think different for robots for the real world. 
And also, when intuitions about artificial intelligence are often very wrong. So, for instance, if I had to clean the room here, I would say, let's first I need a map, and then I need 3D perception, <coughs> and so on. And we have a lot of counterexamples, but we don't need this. But our intuition says, oh, we should do it this way as rational humans. Same thing for diagnosis. Our first reflex is to say, let's analyze what's wrong and do something. That's a reflex, but that's not the way animals do it, and that's not the way we should do it, I think, because that's too difficult, and that's usually uh, very ineffective when everything can happen. So overall, I think in the future, we'll have less and less intensive robots, in more and more autonomous, uh, but we'll be more and more autonomous, in more and more natural environment, and in interaction with humans. And for all of this, uh, we want a robot to be more, to not be like engineers or factory robots, but we want them to be more like uh, animals. So just to thank uh, my students and both on this work, so Anton Cully, who knows the Pierre College, Dan Echtar from New York University, and Jeff Kuhn uh, and the University of Washington. And for you, so that's the solution.